fall of Egyptian dictator Hosni Mubarak is the most significant event in the Middle East for a generation. But the Egyptian revolution was not inevitable. In fact, only a week before Mubarak fell, it seemed as if a state-inspired pogrom would drive the protesters from Tahir Square in the centre of Cairo. On Wednesday the 1st of February, the regime unleashed a mob of ununiformed police and paid thugs on the protesters in Tahir Square. The Vodafone Corporation sent out text messages on behalf of the government calling on people to go and join in the counter-revolutionary mob. The mob, some mounted on horses and a camel, drove the demonstrators the length of the square and almost succeeded in ending the revolution there and then. But the revolutionaries fought back, breaking up paving stones, making Molotov cocktails and building barricades. They fought for two days to drive back the counter-revolution. Student Alia al Rayani was in the thick of the fighting. This is her eyewitness account of the fighting in Tahir Square on the two black days. I arrived at Tahrir Square with my friends on Wednesday at roughly 3.30 p.m. We saw camels and horses, but didn't know what had happened. People told us that a short while before, men on camels and horses had attacked the crowds at the square. We learnt that the crowds had caught some of these men and beaten them. After that, stones and firebombs were being thrown at us and suddenly a mob attacked us. Someone from the army tanks shot back at the pro Mubarak group and this gave us time to group ourselves near the road of Abdul Munam Riyadh. All this lasted for about half an hour. The protesters responded by forming themselves into organized groups and becoming militias. They used anything they could find to protect their heads. Whoever found a helmet wore it, or they wrapped anything around their heads that they could find. They formed a barrier to stop the stones hitting us from Abdul Munam Riyadh and other roads nearby. Suddenly, we started hearing shots being fired and started seeing bodies in front of us. What was surprising was that people were not scared. I could not understand this. Shots were being fired at us. But whenever a group got injured, you'd see another group taking their place to protect the protesters. Some of these pro Mubarak groups from the National Party and some sergeants were in a building in front of the Egyptian Museum and they were throwing firebombs at us and at the museum. The army was quick to put the fire out, but after that the mob came down and started attacking and beating people for literally hours until 8am the next day when the light came up. The majority of the people at the square were injured. The ambulances came, but quite late, at about 3 or 4 a.m., so some people died. What was amazing was that some of the people who'd been hit went to go and get stitched up, and then immediately went back to where the battle was so that they could carry on defending the crowds. I saw such amazing bravery. Everyone organised themselves and we started making firebombs in the square to protect ourselves. I saw the most unexpected yet heroic acts. The revolution did survive the two black days and on Friday the 3rd, the mass demonstrations were back in Tahrir Square. I asked The Guardian's Cairo correspondent, Jack Schenker, to outline the longer term causes of a revolution that was proving to have such depth and stamina early part of the last decade when you were beginning to see street protests in huge numbers over the second Palestinian Intifada, over the Iraq war. And I think you're kind of looking at two strands. You've got that strand which was about um, uh, people coming and reclaiming urban space from the Amr Marquesi Central Security Forces um, and that kind of I guess peaked in 2005 with the, with the Kafaya movement and the challenge to Osman Barak's uh, uh, 
presidency. Um, but separate from that, you had uh, a strike wave, which, like I say, in 2006, Mahalo and Cobra um, really got underway. Mahalo became not just the kind of logistical centre of that strike wave, but a symbolic uh, you know, example for workers across the country of a, a factory in a town which, was, which wasn't, wasn't just fighting, it was, was winning. Um, and then in 2008, 6th of April, we had the uprising in Mahalla, which left uh, three dead uh, after police shot into the crowds. And I think that's when uh, things really started to come together. Now, it's an exaggeration to say that before that, there was no, there was no linkages between the workers' movement and perhaps more urban-based activists in places like Cairo and Alexandria who were demanding more explicit political reforms. And it would also be an exaggeration to say that after 2008, these two came together in some, you know, harmony and <clears throat> there was an instant groundswell. Because in fact, on the 6th of April 2009, when the um, 6th of April group called for a general strike, there was very little coordination with, with the trade unions, there was very little coordination with the workers. And in fact, you just had, not to denigrate them at all, but you had very small, isolated numbers of largely middle-class activists uh, on the streets in Cairo, and no, really, it didn't really resonate around the country. Um, but you did have coming together uh, a groundswell of of political activism. Some of it was more directed, kind of explicitly at economic demands, some more more political demands. But crucially, they it was something which left the old landscape of formal Egyptian opposition politics behind. Like the, old, the old faces, the old figures, the politicians who had been kind of scrabbling around for, for scraps uh, from a regime which uh, was determined to keep up this pluralist facade. Um, you know, parties like Tagamu, like Al Waft, they were being left behind and something new was being born. Uh, June 2010, you got Khalid Sayed. If, if the Khalid Sayed murder had happened without this new political movement that was taking shape, it wouldn't have necessarily have had the same impact as it did. And I think that cannot be underestimated. Uh, it's, it's a complete mistake to focus entirely on Kalina Khalid Sayed, the We Are All Khalid Sayed Facebook group, which is what some elements of the international media are doing. But the reason Khalid Sayed was important was that people could, people across Egypt could relate to the issue of uh, police corruption and police brutality, even if they'd experienced it to a lesser degree than Khaled Said himself did. And then you had Tunisia. And I think Tunisia made people realise that, uh, you know, the, 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 the entire apparatus that Mubarak has set up, which is not just it's not just Amandala, not just Amin Marchesi, it's a, this prodigious network of security agencies that range from very kind of uniformed, formalised uh, uh, structures of, of oppression down to the Baltagia, the thug, you know, casual thugs which get hired for certain occasions um, and neighbourhood informants. I mean, you go to places like in Berber or Wulak al there's, there's an informant on every corner. Um, and people thought, you know, this is a, this is a system we, we physically can't challenge. And Tunisia showed them that you could challenge it. And then I think um, in the aftermath of the Alexandria church bombings, uh, you saw for the first time in Shubra, which is a populous neighbourhood to the north of here, people actually beating the right police back off the streets. And that was a huge moment. Uh, I mean, it didn't last. But that was a huge moment in, in the minds of activists, thinking, OK, we can do this. Ola Shaban led one of the demonstrations in the working class area of Imbaba to Turia Square on the 28th of January has been centrally involved in the protests. She agrees with Jack Schenker about the precursors of the revolutionary movement. But she also highlights the unprecedented response to the call for demonstrations, particularly on the 25th and 28th of January. The masses, the response they gave to the call to mobilize each other and be in the streets on the 25th and then on the 28th and afterwards, um, the inspiration Tunisia gave us, the inspiration the workers' movement gave us for three and four years now. Um, everything that happened with Khalid Saeed movement and the youth movement and the students' movement and other things. But mainly how the masses responded to the call on the 25th. Because we imagined that we can walk and march in a local area like Nahya on the 25th or uh, in Beba on the 28th and get to the Tahrir Square with six, seven, twenty thousand marks, but never ever imagined that we can reach there with three hundred fifty thousand.
he protested this. And that's that march. Other marches were only also mobilizing other people, many, many others. The sheer level of corruption in the Mubarak regime is the factor highlighted by internationally renowned Egyptian novelist Adaf Soeif. She also highlights the importance of the revolution defeating the government's security forces. It was a mythic struggle between good and evil, and good had to win. No, but seriously, I mean, this really was, there was just no doubt that this was, this was, this was good. It was legitimate, it was uh, so much desired, it was um, a long time coming. And I think, you know, ripeness is all. I mean, it, the time had come. Um, and of course the regime had become so, so corrupt that it was rotten to the core. And so the way that it responded was, was so predictable, so banal, so brutal, that uh, it just, you know, made people more and more determined to get rid of it. And in the end, I mean, the, 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 the central security forces were actually beaten, you know, beaten militarily by unarmed young people. I asked Adaf Soeif to outline some of the key turning points in the 18 days of the revolution. The first response that the regime had was to turn, you know, the central security forces onto it. And the, the force with which they put these young men out on, on the street. And, you know, they, they used rubber bullets, they used uh, cluster munitions, they used uh, live, they used... I mean, the amount of gas, the amount of gas canisters that were thrown. So I think that was very important because it was, it was that that the, the, the demonstrations first broke, you know, that line of paramilitary, basically. Um, and then there was also the sort of the taking of the Ministry of the Interior. Now, of course, they didn't actually take it in the end, but they only didn't take it because the army intervened and took it instead. But that sort of the battle for the Ministry of the Interior, that was also a seminal moment. And then you remember they pulled police and security of the streets and they left the capital and well and really all of the country with no no police no security nothing and they opened the jails and turned sort of criminals loose armed criminals just turned them out and this i think i mean this was just unforgivable so there are people demonstrating why does that mean that there are no traffic police and there are no police on the banks? And why does it mean that you go and unlock the jails of armed criminals and turn people loose? And the stories that are going to come out of this, which are beginning to come out, are, are really going to be something to pause at, you know. Um, so that's another. And, and then there was the business of flying the, uh, the fighter jets, the military aircraft, sort of buzzing the capital. I mean, it, 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 what kind of regime does that? And then the culmination was turning um, the army of thugs loose on the protesters in Tahrir Square and the whole thing with Molotov cocktails and the whole thing with sort of... They were being supplied, you know, they were lines that they were being supplied by. Yeah, so um, it's, it's a whole sequence, each item of which demonstrates the bankruptcy, the brutality, the complete sort of, you know, moral decadence. Of, uh, of this regime, um, and together, I think they, they just paint a picture. When you add the venalities that are starting to come out now, with all the money that's been embezzled and, and, and shipped abroad, you know, and, and to, to I mean, you know, what can you say? What can you say? To run a perfectly good education system down, a perfectly good health system down, to have millions of people without access to clean water, while you're stashing away billions what are we talking about? This Minister of the Interior, where does he, I mean, I can understand the Minister of Tourism having some mechanism by which he can make an illegal fortune. Where does the Minister of the Interior get the, you know, the mechanism to, how did he make that money? So it's, uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a nasty story. Speaking in the immediate aftermath of the celebrations that greeted Mubarak's resignation, al Shaban is insistent that the whole regime also has to go and that the revolution must continue. What kind of change is there? Are we part of that change? Are the masses part of 
putting the agenda of how this change is uh, going to happen? Are we dictating how we want this change to take place and uh, which government and by which rules? Uh, are they really lifting the emergency law? Are they really uh, getting rid of the um, internal security uh, unit that is very corrupt and very uh, oppressive? Those are the things that will really make it a victorious um, and really revolution. If and when it is a change for the own regime, there is also the question of what alternative will come. And are we part of it or not, or at least are we part of shaping it or not. So I'd like to see it. Uh, yeah, I, I know people want to see business going back as usual, but I would like to see it as uh, uniting each other it, itself in um, different united fronts, uh, uh, one or two united, strong united fronts, but being able to mobilize each other and mobilize the masses again, being able to see that yes, we know where the Tahrir Square is and we know all the squares in Egypt and we can go back to them. We can come back to the streets and pressure you if you're not going by, um, by the deal. Strikes mushroomed in the two days before Mubarak fell and continued to spread in the week after the revolution gained its first victory. Former independent MP Hamdin Sabaya spoke to me about the relationship between the political and the economic demands of the revolution. When the Egyptian people shouted, a sharp, you read, Scott and Nizam, the people want huh, this regime to uh, crack or fall down. When Mubarak hmm, or Omar Suleiman declares that Mubarak hmm, is ousted huh, already, huh, the first Shouting in the Tahrir Square was a shop you read Bene and Nizam. The people want to construct new regime. Now, I think by now the old regime huh, is vanished, at least in the head. But The Egyptian old state hmm, uh, is still there, and some of the group of benefits hmm, who control Egypt hmm, up to now they are still here. As you see today, hmm, the administrator started to clean. We done the tahrir, huh? Ground, huh? I think we need the same with the old state. We need to clean hmm, the institution of Egypt state from the old faces, the old thinking, the old behavior towards people. But for sure we started, huh? And for sure we will accomplish this. All the time, huh, the people in the street shouting for freedom and social justice at the same time, and human dignity. That's what the Egyptian people need and struggled for. If they win now, hmm, they have the right to get hmm, the right of two main things, the right for every Egyptian citizen, the right of a fair share of national wealth and the right to fair share of national power. Every Egyptian now expect and will get hmm, his right of wealth and power. Of course, to get my uh, uh, share or fair share huh, in power, it's through my vote in free election. A week after the fall of Mubarak, the strikes were still growing and the crowds were back in Tahir Square. 
demanding that the full programme of the revolution be met. For me, and I'm sure that for masses who lead and win this revolution, they need their rights of this wealth, the right of work, fair salary, with a relation between the minimum and maximum salaries in Egypt, the right to social insurance, the right to good education, and good health care, huh? and all this package of economic and social rights, which is very important in Egypt hmm? as the, the, the uh, political and civil rights is very important. Uh, uh, they are uh, very uh, tied to each other. That's what we struggled for. The Egyptian revolution is already part of the chain of events that has seen revolutions explode across the Arab world. No one can predict where this international wave of revolutions will end, nor can we predict the future phases of the Egyptian revolution. What we can say with certainty is that the Egyptian revolution is not over.